Last week, we established to a reasonable degree of certainty that, biblically speaking, there's an ontological difference between first trimester concepticis and third trimester, because the creation of a human being is a two-step process. When God created Adam, he first created a human body, a creature of dust. Then he breathed the breath of life, that is, a human spirit, into the nostrils of the creature of dust. And when he did that, the creature of dust became a living soul. And a living soul is a whole human being. The word soul is not a synonym for spirit. Your spirit isn't the real you any more than your body is the real you. The real you is a soul, which is an integrated creature, a human body integrated together or knitted together with a human spirit. And the two together make up a living soul. And though Adam was formed outside the womb, it appears that the process of the creation of a living soul, i.e. a person, takes place within the womb uh, in a way that is ontologically the same as the process that took place in the Garden of Eden when the first human person was created. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explains that a new creation will be uh, analogous to its current creation. And... um, In both, that which is physical comes first, followed by that which is spiritual. The body precedes the spirit. Accordingly, when a person is conceived, that which is formed in the womb first is the body, which is formed naturally. Then when the body has been formed, God creates a spirit which is fitted for that body and knits the two together in the womb. As we read in Zechariah 12, 1, The Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth forms the spirit of a man within him. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when that miracle of gestation occurs, but it does tell us that life is in the blood and that the human spirit dwells in the circulatory system of the human body, in the heart and lungs. Accordingly, it's reasonable to surmise that ensoulment almost certainly does not occur prior to the eighth week of gestation, when the circular system is developed to the point that it reaches all parts of the body. So the earliest time that we could expect ensoulment to occur would be in the third month of gestation. Now, medically speaking, doctors and scientists are reasonably certain that the ability to perceive is uh, to perceive that one is a living soul. The emergence of consciousness, the development of capacity for self-awareness, begins about the 24th week of gestation. Well, in order to know that you're a living soul, you have to first be a living soul. And this indicates clearly that ensoulment must be taking place prior to the sixth month of pregnancy. And that leaves us with a window of about 90 days from the ninth week of gestation to the 23rd when it ought to be occurring that God forms the spirit of a man within his body. However, last week, we also looked at the ordeal outlined for us in Numbers 5, in which a man who suspects that the child his wife is carrying is is not his own, and he can bring her before the priest to discover the truth of the matter. And the priest will perform a ritual, during the course of which he will twice administer an abortifacient to the woman, And if the woman miscarries, then this indicates that she's guilty of adultery. But if the woman does not miscarry, this indicates that she's innocent. And the husband is to set his suspicion aside and bring his wife back home. And this compels us to ask whether or not the fetus whose life would be sacrificed to confirm the guilt of the mother is, in fact, the life of a person, the life of a living soul. The scripture is ready to hand with an answer to that question because in Deuteronomy 24, 16, God says, fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall shall suffer the penalty for his own sin. Thus, if if God is consistent, if God does not speak with a forked tongue, it, it can only be that in his eyes, in his view, In his estimation, the conceptus who is set at risk risk in the ordeal of Numbers 5 is not yet a living soul. And at what point of the course of gestation 
would this ordeal have occurred? Well, according to Numbers 5, when the woman could no longer hide her pregnancy from her husband, which for a woman of average size and healthy weight would be sometime in the fourth month. And this narrows the window for insolment to about a four-week window from about the 19th week to about the 23rd week of gestation. And once insolment occurs, there can be no question about the personhood of the preborn child. As we read in Galatians 1.15, where Paul testifies that God set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Likewise, God says of the prophet of Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And in Psalm 139, 13 through 16, David states that for the record, uh, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My constitution was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, curiously wrought from the most basic elements of the earth. And your eyes beheld my unformed, my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were determined for me, when as yet there was none of them. And with this in view, I'm fully persuaded that the moral weight of terminating the life of a child within 16 to 20 weeks of its due date is equal to that of terminating the life of any human being. Now, You'll notice that I did not use the word murder in that statement. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that the way that conservative Christians culturally often use the word murder in regard to abortion flattens the moral landscape of the act of abortion in a way that's biblically untenable. But as I pointed out in other lessons, the Bible distinguishes between first-degree murder second-degree murder, manslaughter, negligent homicide, and self-defense. And in my opinion, any biblical view of late-term abortion ought to be at least as nuanced as that, taking into account all the circumstances surrounding the action. Because the termination of the life of another human being takes on many forms and occurs in many different circumstances and can carry many different degrees of moral weight. Now, I'm not going to try to go into detail on this question and try to de define every hypothetical situation. That would be a fool's errand. But I do want to point out that using a pile hammer where a scalpel is indicated is almost always counterproductive. Because flattening the moral landscape doesn't sharpen the conscience. It dulls the conscience. And a blunted conscience is an undiscerning conscience. Not only that, but I'm not in the business of telling people what to think about such things. My highest aim is to help people figure out how to think about such things. And the knowledge that, biblically speaking, unborn children who have reached the 19th week of gestation are bona fide living souls ought to be enough to inform the conscience of anyone who has the mind of Christ of the profound moral weight of terminating the life of such a one. And that's who this message is directed toward, people possessed of the mind of Christ, Christians. I'm not preaching to the world about this. I'm preaching to the church. Because to those who take the Bible seriously, it ought to be patently obvious that fetuses beyond the midpoint of gestation are persons and that terminating the life of such a one carries a moral, a moral weight on par with that of some degree of murder. Now, that's plain to see, or it ought to be plain to see. But what about the moral weight of terminating the life of a conceptus that has been gestating for 18 weeks or less? Well, this is harder to assess, but not impossible. For while the Bible does not actually give us a schedule for the content for the comparative value of one human life over another, it does tell us that human life is more valuable than animal life. 
For instance, in Matthew 10, 29 through 31, Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And again, in Luke 12, 6 through 7, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, any sparrow listening to this might not feel all that comforted by that because of the final analysis Human life is deemed to be of greater value than avian life. But don't miss the analysis itself. Because the fact that a human life is worth many times more than a sp the life of a sparrow demonstrate that the lives of sparrows do have an appreciable and calculable worth. And with this in view, it seems reasonable to propose that whatever the value of the life of pre ensoulment human beings, though apparently less than that of a living soul, must surely be greater than that of an animal. Humankind having been fashioned in God's image. And this is something that ought to speak to both the church and the world on some, le on some level, because there's a great deal of crossover between pro-choice advocates and animal rights advocates. Sadly, Many of them don't see the flaw in their calculus and the value of human life, though it should be obvious. I mean, hunters, when they find a deer caught in a fence or two rams stuck in lock horns with one another, will put down their guns and rescue the animal. And this is no less than God expects from us. Proverbs 12.10, whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Proverbs 27, 23, Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds. Exodus 23, 4 through 5, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Deuteronomy 25, 4, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. Exodus 23, 11, but the seventh year you shall let your fields rest and lie fallow that the poor of your people may eat and what they leave the, the beasts of the field may eat. And you shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Exodus 23, 12, six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your servant and the alien may be refreshed. Hosea 2, 18, and I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground, and I will establish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. Excuse me, I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. Genesis 49, 5 through 6, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel, nor my glory be joined to their company, for they killed people in anger, and they crippled bulls for sport. Beloved, clearly God values the well-being of animals, and he expects us to do the same. And there's no doubt in my mind that the ontological value of a pre ensoulment human being is greater than that of any living animal. After all, the human body is the vessel within which God would in due time create a spirit perfectly fitted for that body, Prior to ensoulment, a conceptus is, a, is not yet a living soul, but it is also not a cipher. It isn't nothing. It's something. It may not yet be a living soul, but it is a living being. And it's not just any living being, but a living humanoid, a living homonym, 
uh, hominid. And as such, that conceptus ought to be regarded with at least as much dignity, decency, empathy, compassion, and altruism as we grant to animals at the bare minimum. Because conscientiously, we know that a human conceptus deserves more dignity, more decency, more empathy, more compassion, and more altruism than that which we afford to animals. And accordingly, any thought of deliberately terminating the life of a human conceptus ought to carry at least as much moral weight in your heart as does the thought of terminating the life of a beloved family pet. Thus, as I understand the matter, early term abortion does set those who participated at moral hazard even though it is not the same degree of moral hazard taken on by those who participate in late-term abortion. Now, having said all that, what shall we say more? What does that mean for Christians? And once again, it is to Christians that I'm preaching this morning. I'll do with our response to the world on this next week. But today's sermon is for us. In consideration of all that I've brought to you from the Word of God today and over the course of the last few weeks, what should our position on this important question be? Well, it's my considered opinion that all Bible-believing Christians ought to be fundamentally opposed to abortion, both late-term and early-term abortion. That in view of everything that the Bible tells us about God's view of pre-born children, our first instinctual answer, whenever we're presented with the question of abortion, ought to be no. That ought to be our default starting place. If you are a Christian woman and you are persuaded, as I am, that abortion is a serious matter with serious consequences, then do all you can to avoid ever having one. If you're a Christian man, and you're persuaded that I am, that abortion is a serious matter with serious consequences, then don't ever put a woman in a position of ever having to consider having one. That ought to be our first answer every time. But that may not be our last answer every time because life isn't theoretical. Real life is real. It is messy. It is complicated, and sometimes even life and death decisions are less than clear-cut. And this is so when it comes to abortion. What I want to do with the remainder of my time this morning is to try to apply what I've said over the course of the last few weeks to some plausible real-life scenarios. Now, the first scenario is all too common, because the great majority of conceptuses, 86%, who meet their end as a result of abortion have been conceived outside of wedlock. The mothers most commonly are single women between the ages of 15 and 39, and the reasons given for having had an abortion are as follows. 25% not ready for children. 23% can't afford a baby. 19% done having children, 8% don't want to be a single mother, 7% not mature enough to raise a child, 4% having a child would interfere with my career, 4% physical health problems, 3% fetal health problems, one half of 1% victim of rape or incest, and 6% gave no reason. So according to the statistics, somewhere between 86% and 92% of abortions performed in this country are sought by people who, for one reason or another, simply don't want children. Now, consider that in the context of the following statistics. 50% of Americans identify as Protestant, evangelical or non-denominational Christians. And the early, excuse me, and the Christian Bible roundly condemns both the life choices that create the demand for abortion and participation in late-term abortions 
and considers early term abortions to be a shame at best. 24% of Americans identify as Catholic. And in the Catholic Church, abortion is roundly condemned, as are the life choices that create the demand for abortion. 3% of Americans identify as Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, Baha'i, or Rastafarian. And all of these religions roundly condemn both the life choices that create the demand for abortion and participation in late-term abortions, and they consider early-term abortion to be a shame at best. 2% of Americans identify as Jewish, and in opposition to historical uh, rabbinical Judaism, the Hebrew Bible roundly condemns both the life choices that create the demand for abortion, participation in late-term abortion, and considers early-term abortion to be a shame at best. 1% of Americans identify as Muslim, and the Koran roundly condemns both the life choices that create the demand for abortion and participation in late-term abortions, and considers early-term abortion to be a shame at best. 20% of Americans identify as non-religious, agnostic, or atheist. But even among this group, 70% believe late-term abortions ought to be illegal, and a growing number of secular humanists identify as pro-life. So when you break it down, if everybody had the courage of their convictions, the number of abortions performed in this country would drop to a fraction of the current 880,000 per year. If all secularists had the courage of their convictions, there would be only 642,000 abortions per year in this country. If all Muslims had the courage of their convictions, there would be only 633,000. If all Jews followed the Hebrew Bible, there would be only 616,000. If all Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs, Baha'is, and Rastafarians had the courage of their convictions, there would be only 592,000. And if all Christians in this country had the courage of their convictions, there would be only 118,000 abortions in the U.S. every year. Because, beloved, 90% of all abortions performed in the United States on an annual basis are procured by people whose proclaimed value systems forbid or discourage abortion. And 54% of all abortions performed in the United States every year are procured by women who identify as Christian. And that is a damned shame. Now, when you consider that figure as a percentage of the total population, it looks a little better because while one half of 1% of non-Christians in this country have abortions in a given year, only one-fifth of 1% 1 of Christians do. So Christians, on average, are only 29% as promiscuous as non-Christians, for what that's worth. Nevertheless, these numbers are nothing to be proud of. But it does add gravitas to the elementary nature of the answer that I have to offer to one of the most pressing social and moral questions of our day, because Christians are constantly asking, what can we do to effectively reduce the number of abortions that occur in this country every year? And for the answer to that question, we keep turning to politicians. We keep turning to the government, hoping that they'll solve this problem for us by making legal abortions harder to obtain in this country. But perhaps there's a better idea. Perhaps there's a simpler way. Perhaps there's a more elegant way for this to occur. What can Christians do to effectively reduce the number of abortions that occur in this country every year? Well, for starters, 
stop having them. If every Christian in this country stood up and said, I will take responsibility for my own actions. I will not lie to cover up my sins, and I will not allow my unborn child to pay the price for my choices. The number of abortions performed in this country would be cut in half just like that. Overnight, the number would drop from 880,000 per year to just over 400,000 per year. Now, that's still 400,000 too many, but it would be a step in the right direction. That would bring the abortion rate down to 1971 levels. And it would give the church a much firmer leg to stand on to oppose abortion on demand. And frankly, I don't understand why this couldn't happen. I mean, culturally speaking, the shame of having a child out of wedlock is practically non-existent. And particularly when it comes to young women, the church is eager to forgive eager to understand and eager to support whether she wants to keep the child or make an adoption plan. Nary a church in 21st century America would turn its back on one of its own for the cause of sexual sin. And if you're in a church that would, find another church. Because I guarantee that there's one right around the corner that will bend over backwards ministering to you to prevent you from aborting your unborn child. But for the love of God and for the love of the least of his little ones, don't allow shame or the fear of shame to cause you to fall into an even greater sin. As it says in Deuteronomy 24, 16, fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall suffer the penalty of his own sin. And again, in Ezekiel 16, 20 through 21, and as if your whoredom were not enough, you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. You may not feel worthy to be called a child of God, but in your repentance, God considers your children to be his children, no matter how they were conceived. God says, these are still my children. Now, the most common cause for the fear of shame among Christian women who find themselves with an unwanted pregnancy is simple and straightforward because though our society laughs out loud at the prospect of chastity, the conservative Christian community continues to value chastity and to take a very dim view of fornication as it ought to. Well, God values chastity too. And he takes a dim view of uh, fornication also. But he can't be fooled by a cover-up And it takes an even dimmer view of sins against the least of his little ones. Now, there are other reasons given for procuring an abortion that are more compelling than fear and shame. For instance, I find it pretty compelling whenever someone pleads the case of a woman who has been the victim of rape or incest. Or the case of a mother whose life would be endangered by carrying her child to term. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't offer as much guidance on either of these scenarios. Now, in the case of rape or incest, I have known women who believed so so steadfastly that a child should not die for the sins of his father that they refused to consider abortion, even though the child they were carrying had been conceived in the commission of a brutal and shameful crime. And I applaud them for having the courage of their convictions. But it makes me want to cringe out of my skin to imagine any scenario in which a woman who were the victim of rape or incest would be compelled by others to carry a child so conceived to term. No, she 
has a very difficult choice to make. Which choice is between her and her Lord? If she can bear the grief of carrying the child to term, may God bless her, and may God bless any brother or sister in Christ who helps her to bear that burden and walk that walk. But if she cannot, may God have mercy. As Paul says in Romans 14, 4, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. In a similar vein, the Bible offers no easy answers for mothers whose lives would be endangered if they were to carry their child to term. I have a niece who has severe epilepsy. Her body is very fragile, and her equilibrium can be thrown off by improper lighting, a poor night's rest, the dyes in medications, and subtle changes in body chemistry. And her doctors have advised her that, far from carrying a child to term, even just the hormonal changes concomitant to being pregnant could be fatal to her. And being a conservative Christian, she is fundamentally opposed to abortion at any stage in pregnancy. And accordingly, by mutual agreement, she and her husband have taken exacting measures to prevent her from ever becoming pregnant. But if by some strange and unforeseeable turn of events, she should ever find herself to be with child, I can't imagine anyone encouraging her to attempt to carry the child to term. Indeed, if anyone showed up at her house with their Bible open to John 15, 13, and said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, I can just about guarantee you that my brother, my sister-in-law, and my nephew-in-law would take a newfound interest in the laying on of hands. Because no one on earth has the moral authority to compel another person to be self-sacrificing to that degree. And I know of no guidance that the Bible has to offer in such a situation. No one can ask any more of a woman in such a situation than to do as her conscience compels her. Now, another cause for which abortion is sometimes invoked is to alleviate the potential suffering of the child in the case of probable physical or mental defect. And here the Bible has at least something to offer. In Isaiah 45, 9 through 10, God says, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to a father, what sort of creature are you begetting? Or to a woman, what with what sort of creature are you in labor? And this would seem to preclude terminating the life of an unborn child on the basis of our, project, our projections about how long he might live or what the quality of his life might be. Rather, as Job says in Job 12.10, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. But by far the most off-sided defense of abortion offered by 21st century Americans is that of personal body sovereignty. My body my choice. Well, to a non-Christian, one might answer, yes, it is your body and it is your choice. And it was your body and your choice when you had your clothes on. And it was your body and your choice when you took your clothes off. And it was your body and your choice when you chose not to use contraception. But to a Christian, God's answer to this plea is very different and very clear. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And again, in Romans 12, 1 through 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Romans 14, 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Isaiah 43, 1, but now thus saith the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Beloved, body sovereignty is a perfectly reasonable argument for a non-Christian to make. But for a Christian, it holds no water. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. There can be no doubt that though it may not always be sin, no one can glorify God and their body by terminating the life of the child that's growing within them. As God says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, Now choose life so that you and your children may live. That, beloved, is what the Bible has to say to Christians on the matter of abortion. And that is the counsel that I would give to any Christian seeking biblical guidance on the question of abortion. But what about the world? I mean, we live in a fallen world, and most of the people in the world don't care what the Bible has to say on the matter. What shall we say to them? What should the church's response to the world on the question of abortion be? Come back next week, and I'll tell you. That, beloved, is my lesson for today.